The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's webinar. We're glad you could join us. The title of the webinar is Practical Ethics for Protective Services, and I will introduce our speaker here in just a little bit. Uh, next slide. A quick disclaimer before we get started, the APS TARC is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. So, uh, next slide. A uh, little note about our APS TARC. If you're not familiar with us, we're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us at any time. There'll be some contact info displayed at the end of the webinar where you can get a hold of us if you want to. Um, we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Next slide. Please consider joining one of our peer-to-peer -peer calls if you've never been on one before. We have three calls per month. There's one for investigators, there's one for supervisors, and then there's one for administrators. Uh, the schedule for these calls is on your screen, but you can also go to our website and look under peer support and check out the schedule there. You can uh, reach out to us as well if you'd like to register for one of those, or there's info about how to register on the website. Next slide. And we also have a page on our site dedicated to COVID-19 and APS. So there's a link at the top of the web page in a red box um, when you get to our website um, to get to the COVID-19 page. On this page, you'll find resource information and a summary of state program responses to the pandemic. Um, next slide. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded and it will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify via email all of the people who've registered today when it is posted online and available to watch. If you have questions of our presenter, uh, you can simply type them in the questions box at any time. Um, but we'll pause to answer questions at the end of the webinar and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can. All participants are muted for this webinar and you must use your computer to access audio. There's no phone audio for this event. If you have any problems with the audio, we suggest exiting the webinar and then re-entering. That seems to clear things up quite a bit. Note that due to the large number of people currently working remotely in the US, uh, webinar systems are occasionally experiencing problems here and there. So please be patient with us. If you have any issues, we'll try to resolve them quickly. And then finally, today's slides are available to download in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, next slide. So now we would like to launch a quick poll to get a feel for the professions of the folks in our audience. And I'm going to launch that right now. You can vote by clicking directly on your screen. And the question is, which of the following categories do you identify the most with? And your options are adult protective services professional, other social services professional, uh, medical professional, legal professional, or other, if you don't feel like you fit into any of those categories. Um, and again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Um, if you're in full screen mode, you might have to exit out of that for just a second to vote, and then you could go back into full screen mode. And the votes are rolling in. We'll leave it up just a few more seconds to give people a chance to vote. And again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen to whatever corresponds most or, most, um, or what category you identify the most with. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll out now and then share the results with everybody. It looks like 79% of you are APS professionals, 11% fall under other social service professional, 1% under medical, 2% under legal, and 6% under other. So thanks so much for taking that poll and giving us an idea of who's out there in the audience for us. So um, next slide. I will take just a moment to introduce today's speaker. Chris Dubel is the Assistant Director of Training at Temple University in Harrisburg. I have known Chris for many years. He is one of my favorite speakers, very dynamic, very engaging. He is a pro, and he just happens to also know APS stuff very well. Um, so I think we're lucky to have him today, and now I'll turn things over to Chris. All right, perfect. You can hear me okay, correct, Andy? Yep, we sure can. Okay, fantastic. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I hope I can live up to what Andy said. I did ask him to make the introduction very brief because we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about one of my favorite topics. Andy said I only had three hours and we'd be done by six o'clock Eastern time. So I think we're all set. Uh, no, we're going to get this done <laughs> by four o'clock. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about myself as we go throughout this presentation. I do think it's important for you, though, to know for those of you who have not heard me speak, the moment in my life that I realized that protective services and adult protective services is an incredibly unique profession. Some of you who have heard me speak before have heard this story, but it is that moment, it's kind of that light bulb moment in my life. And if you are in an allied discipline, you're included in this as well. Anytime that we are working with adults or older adults, who are vulnerable to abuse, neglect, or theft. It's just, there's something that is different than anything else that I have experienced in my background of social work. I have been a hospital social worker for about seven, eight years before coming to what's called the Institute on Protective Services here in Pennsylvania. The Institute is funded by our Department of Aging. And this was back in 2002 when we first got it started. And I thought, I was pretty convinced that I could do this job because adult protective services was just gonna be hospital social work without the walls. One of the first cases that I went out on was in Philadelphia. Uh, Joe Snyder, who many of you know, who's done a lot of national work in protective services, invited me to spend some time with his investigators at the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging. So, I was, I was gung-ho, I'm a hospital social worker, I can do this, and get out on one of the first cases. It's a beautiful June day, and the allegation is that an older woman is having somebody from the community come in and harass her. That's all we know. So the investigator and I go, and we're talking to her for a while, and all she will say is, my son has taken care of it. My son has taken care of it. I'm using all my best hospital social work skills. Still can't get anything other than my son has taken care of it. Pretty sure I ordered her a bedside commode that she really didn't need, but I was running out of options. About 20, 25 minutes into the interview, her son shows up. And her son sits right down next to me. And I know it's pretty hard to tell on a virtual platform, but underneath this shirt, there are like guns of steel going on underneath here. Like, I, and this dude was a bodybuilder. He was jacked. And he sits down right next to me. But remember, I'm a hospital social worker, and APS is just going to be like hospital social work without the walls. So without any kind of fear or reservation, I turn to him and I say, hey, we've been talking to your mom here for a while about this person that's been coming in and harassing her. She says you've taken care of it. Can you tell me how you've taken care of it? He looked me right in the eyes and he said, I killed the guy last night. I literally started clicking my heels like I was in Wizard of Oz going, this isn't hospital social work anymore. By the time the investigator catches up to me in the car, I said, I have two questions for you. One, I said, can you take me back to where I'm staying? I really need to change. And number two, what are you going to do with this case? He looks at me and says, I'm going to close it. The son has taken care of it. Back in 2002, and now for 18 and a half years, I have enjoyed and been engaged in protective services, being such a unique and special discipline. And again, those of you in allied disciplines, you join protective services in that commitment and that uniqueness in serving people who are vulnerable to abuse, neglect, and theft. But I've also come to the appreciation over those 18 and a half years, and what we're going to talk about today is that much of what we do is filled with ethical decisions. And I imagine that's why most of you are on here, from policy-level decisions to supervision, to direct practice, investigations, providing services. We ask the protective services and our allied disciplines to be constantly making ethical decisions. 
And I'm not sure we always put them in that framework. Unless we take ethics along for the journey of protective services, we run the risk of harming the very people we are entrusted to serve. That's what this presentation is all about. Normally, and Andy knows this, I have like 27 learning objectives. We're doing group exercise. We're building human pyramid. No, we're not building human pyramids, but we don't have enough time to have a good conversation and interaction. So I only have two learning objectives for today, or two things that I want to accomplish. One is by the end of this time that we have together, I want all of us thinking about all of the ways that ethics is part of what we do all the ethical components to what we do in protective services. And the second thing is to give you a very, very brief introduction into a practical way to make some of these ethical decisions that we face. So one, get us thinking about all the ways that ethics invades what we do. And number two, offer you up a model that can help us make the decisions in a very practical, in real time way. Before we get there, we need to talk about just a couple of definitions or a few definitions. The first is ethics. Ethics is, I like to describe it as that moment that we think, that moment that we go, hmm, the moment that we think about what is good, bad, right, and wrong. Now, if there's an ethicist in the room, they're going, well, Chris, you have to tell them that it's part of a legitimate ethical decision. Yeah, we'll get there. But for now, I want us thinking about ethics as all of those moments in our day-to-day -day work, whether you are a macro policy level person, whether you're in a home with a hoarding situation going on that smells quite right, or your supervisor trying to coach that investigator through a situation or through a difficult, challenging case. Ethics are those moments that we stop and we think about what's good, bad, right, or wrong. Morality falls into the category of what I like to consider our insta reactions. These are the things that oftentimes occur for us without much thought. Morality, when we talk about this in a full seminar, I always ask people where you get your morality from, and people say the same things all the time. Family, religion, culture, community, school. And what we know about morality is that it is ingrained in us very early and changes very little as we get older. Some of us were brought up with a moral code of cleanliness is next to godliness. You don't have to be in protective services more than 48 hours to know that that moral code is going to get assaulted quite frequently. The difference between morality and ethics is we may still hold that moral judgment, but ethics allows us to stop and think and even at times defend somebody's right to live in a way that we would not want to live ourselves or we don't su uh, support morally. Laws, regulations, and policies, and I know I'm gonna like get on the edge here because we've got some lawmakers and policy folks in here. These I also put in the insta reactions. I just want you to envision this person in your office and you all have one of them. That person that goes, well, if it's not in the APS code book, we can't do it. That's an insta reaction, an insta reaction. And we do it all the time here in Pennsylvania. I do it. What does the law say? What do the regulations, what do the policies say? Let me point out the difference between ethics, laws, and regulations and policies. We hope that our laws, regulations, and policies are based upon an ethical construct. But when I taught in Temple's Masters of Social Work program for many years, I used to challenge the social workers to say, what is one thing that you could do today for the good of a client that would get you fired instantly? And then why aren't you doing it? Now, please do not go back to your office and go, oh, I went to an ethics seminar and they said I should do this regardless of what the policy, that's not what I'm saying. But we do need 
And if we had more time, this is a fun topic to explore. What are the laws, regulations, and policies that kind of make you think and make you go, is this right? Is this good? As many of you are doing right now, you're going, oh, yeah, yeah, that regulation I struggle with. What you're doing is ethical thinking. So laws, regulations, and policies, obviously we support and we follow, but they are not the same as ethics. They tend to be an insta reaction. One other area that I want to point out, or one other definition, is professional ethics. And what professional ethics attempt to do is to bridge the gap between people like me that like to think and talk and just talk it out and never really get to an end point, and those of us who also have these insta reactions. So professional ethics tries to make an ethical code practical for particular professions. I'm a social worker by background. I have the NASW. I know that there are medical professionals. If you're a psychologist, psychiatrist, if you're a physician, if you were an attorney, if you were a nurse, you all have a set of code of ethics. Adult Protective Services and NAPSA has a set of code of ethics. And the Administration for Community Living, which I'll touch on at the end, has called on all of us to have a very robust set of code of ethics. And what that will allow for us is we don't have to sit there and reinvent the wheel every time. We can go to that code of ethics and see if it applies to a particular circumstance or situation. Two more definitions that we want to hit. Ethical dilemmas. Ethical dilemmas are where we've reached essentially a fork in the road. If we go path A, we can't go path B. If we go path B, can't go path A. A compromise is over. All of our best kind of skills at negotiation are over. We now have to make a choice. And generally, by the very nature of it being a dilemma, neither path is foolproof. Neither path is ideal. Both generally have some positives to them and some negatives, but we need to decide. I am going to say something right now. I do not have any scientific evidence to back this up. I just have had the privilege, both here in Pennsylvania, of being around protective service folks for a long time, as well as uh, chatting with a lot of your uh, colleagues nationally. I believe that ethical dilemmas and facing ethical dilemmas are as much of a reason for burnout and, and PS staff being overstressed as caseloads, as salary, as all of those other things that we typically address when we deal with stress. It is that constant of having to make an either or decision. Let me give you an example. A uh, PS investigator here in Pennsylvania, and let me just describe her by telling you that if she ever moves to your state, you want her on your team. She is that good. She's just a fantastic investigator, has been doing this for a long time. She talked to me a while back, and she came to me pretty much in tears because she had a situation where it was an 80 year old man who, and I always, in other contexts of training, I always say I wish capacity was like the turkey at Thanksgiving, where there's the little button and it pops up when it's done. All of us on this call know that capacity is never that clear, that capacity is not a dichotomy, it's, a, it's on a continuum. And this, this guy just sat in right in the middle of that gray area. Moments you'd feel he was fairly lucid and able to make decisions, and then other moments you'd be like, no. And so she eventually reached the decision that she needed to pursue what we have here in Pennsylvania as an involuntary intervention and have him placed. This gentleman had lived in the same home his entire life. And when I say his entire life, he had actually been born in the home that he was living in. Here in Pennsylvania, as many of your jurisdictions, our PS folks have to go out and do a reassessment prior to closing a case, making sure that the services that they put in place 
actually did reduce the risk. She went and met with him before she could barely say hi. He said, I know who you are. I hate you. I hate you with everything I have. I hate you more than I've hated anyone else. And I will hate you as I die here because you put me here. As she and I would spend a long time together talking, it is those types of ethical dilemmas that our PS staff and our allied disciplines routinely face. And we can't just consider them a risk issue or a regulatory issue or a policy issue. They're an ethics issue. And by the time, and I walked her through a similar experience as we're gonna talk about here real briefly, by the time we got to the end of that conversation, her feedback for me was, this is gonna be so hard, but at least I can go to bed at night knowing I did the ethically right thing. Those are ethical dilemmas. Do I allow somebody to stay in their home or do I have them um, be placed? What actions do I take? What actions don't I take? Ethical breaches, on the other hand, are where there are clear violations of ethical rules. Now, I always have fun in seminars. We talk about all the different ethical breaches that you can do. But one of the things, to give you an example, is you can't steal from a client. You just can't do it. Now, somebody should have told these two women uh, these two women are Barbara Lieberman and Jan Van Holt. Barbara Lieberman has the dark hair. Jan Van Holt has the lighter hair. Uh, Barbara was a former, for my legal folks on the, uh, on the call, elder law attorney who decided that it might be good to go into the guardianship business. And so her scheme was that she would get people to... Uh, she would be appointed as guardian of people, and then she would steal over $3 million of their money. But she needed the older adults, right? <laughs> Guess where Barbara Lieberman's sister, Jan Van Holt, worked? Some of you are already ahead of me. Jan, Adult Protective Services Investigator, casework. I need to add to the picture because there is another person, William Price, who was also an APS investigator who conspired to funnel these older adults and steal millions and millions of dollars from them. That is why I like this picture of them a whole lot better than the first one. All three uh, were convicted uh, of, for their crimes. What's interesting though about ethical breaches and what we can have a lot of fun when we do seminars, what's very interesting about ethical breaches is that just with some twists and turns and just changing that context slightly, they start to become more of an ethical dilemma. Quite recently, I sat in a self-care seminar. And in that self-care seminar, the presenter went on for about 30 or 40 minutes about how during this time of the pandemic, during this time when many of us are working from home, we should be very liberal with the amount of time we take for ourselves. It doesn't matter if it's an established break. If you need to take care of your kids for 15 minutes, you go do it. You need to do the laundry, you go do it. You care for yourself because this is a tough, Time. I sat there and got, went, hmm, if I'm taking away time from my work and not putting that back in at any point, is that stealing from my clients? Is there an ethical component? And I know some of you are going, you're calling, you've got Andy on speed dial, and you're calling, like, Andy, he's attacking self care. You need to pull the plug on this webinar. No, not necessarily, because I think there's an ethical argument to what this person was saying. But this is my point about ethics being a part of everything that we do. 
whether it be self-care, whether it be motivational interviewing, whether it be how we go about conducting investigations, the policies that we put in place. Ethics and ethical thinking needs to be a part of everything that we do in protective services. So if it's a part of everything we do in protective services, how do we go about kind of putting that into practice? How do we go about having some idea of how to apply ethical concepts to the decisions that we need to make? What we need to do is adopt a set of ethical principles. And I'm going to show you a set of ethical principles that I've adapted from biomedical principles just because I think they're fairly simple to explain and talk about. But there are ton Google ethical principles and you will find more than you ever wanted to know. NAPSA has ethical principles. One I think I probably need to add to, into this slide for protective services is NAPSA, like other ethical principle sets, is very big on rights. And so rights can be a component. But I want to use these ethical principles just to illustrate some of the things that we see in protective services. But what we do for decision making in protective services or anywhere we want to apply these principles, so if you're in an allied discipline, this goes for you too, is we take a situation and we rank our principles in the priority that they apply to that situation. So I'll give you an example here in a few minutes, but essentially whatever I rank as my number one principle, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I don't violate that principle or I, you know, I don't violate it more than any other principle. But number five, number six, that last one that we have, that may get compromised in a number of ways for principles that rank higher. Again, if that's not making sense, I'll show you an example that will help bring some clarity to that. But let's look at the principles, and you can use whatever principles you want, but for the sake of today, here's a set of principles that you could use in thinking about any kind of ethical situation that you face. The first principle here you see is non-maleficence. That is our obligation to not cause harm. This again is a great topic to have discussion around and recently did this at the NAPSA conference and there was a lot of great feedback on the different ways that we can cause harm in protective services. But usually when we talk about this, it follows the same pattern. We kind of think in big terms, like, well, somebody could die, somebody could this, be physically injured. And we tend to think in those terms. And when we only think in those terms, in general, I think protective services does a good job of not causing harm. But I don't like to think in just those terms. I like to think in terms that are a little bit more subtle and creep up on us in protective services. It's a Saturday evening and you've got an emergency placement to do. And there is one nursing facility bed in your area that is willing to accept this person. And you know a lot about that facility because you've done the three investigations there in the last month. And your assessment is it's not terrible. It's not awful, but it's certainly not where you're going to put your family or your loved one. If we risk harming someone by sending now, so you're going to go, well, is that better than they're on the street? That's what we've got to consider in every particular situation. Here's one, and, and I know we've got some Pennsylvania colleagues here. Here in Pennsylvania, like I think every jurisdiction that I've encountered, and older adults here in Pennsylvania, and oftentimes adults with disabilities, can refuse to participate in an investigation, but they can't refuse an investigation. So if we get a report of need, we decide that it needs an investigation, that older adult can say, get lost, 
Well, our protective service folks still have an obligation to go out and do collateral interviews. And we've scripted them as to confidentiality and how to maintain that. But I am, I shouldn't reveal my age, I guess, on a, a webinar with however many people, but I am 48 and a half. That means here in the state of Pennsylvania, I am only 11 and a half years from being 60. And I can't say this too loudly because I live in a townhouse community and I don't know what bleeds through the walls, but I don't like my neighbors very much. And if I'm 60 and you come because you got a report on me and I say get lost and you go right over to my neighbors and start asking questions, even if you maintain my confidentiality, I'm going to be upset. I'm going to be embarrassed obligation to not cause harm in protective services we tend to do a good job of this especially in the bigger picture but it's the small nuances that we need to think about now beneficence is our obligation to do good and remove harm that is our justification for talking to collaterals right our justification our ethical decision and our ethical justification we're talking to those collaterals, why I can support teaching here in Pennsylvania that you need to talk to collaterals, even if the older adult says get lost, is because of beneficence. Because as a society here in Pennsylvania and across the country, we've said that protective services not only doesn't cause harm, but is there to do good and remove harm. Back to my point about stress for protective services. I will tell you, if you travel through Pennsylvania and you talk to some of your PS colleagues here, they will tell you it can be very hard and kind of, it can give them some ethical pause when they have somebody that is clearly cognitively capacitated telling them they don't want them to talk to anybody else. They feel that right, that intrusion. But beneficence is our obligation to do good and remove harm. That's why we justify a thorough investigation despite what the older adult might want. Beneficence is at the heart of every root cause analysis I've been involved in. It's always about asking what else could have been done? What else could we do? We did this, this, and this, but could have we done more? Autonomy is another interesting concept for protective services and the allied disciplines that work with us. Because for protective services, our sense of autonomy, our value on autonomy sits somewhere between child protective services that I don't want to say they don't value autonomy. I think I just used the double negative in, the, in a sentence. I think I did it accurately. I once had a student uh, use a triple negative in a sentence, which I think is okay because the double negative cancels it out, the triple reinstates it. Sorry, easily distracted. But autonomy is our obligation to respect an individual's right to decide and also experience the consequences of their actions. So we sit somewhere between ch child protective services which doesn't have as much emphasis on autonomy as we do in adult and older adult protective services. And our colleagues in domestic violence who have built their entire culture and policy and practice all around an individual's autonomy and decision making. I've mentioned some direct practice examples in, in, in protective services. I'm going to use a policy example here for autonomy. Every time we expand mandatory reporting in our states, we violate to some extent the principle of autonomy. Because we say if you encounter a particular professional or a particular person in the community and you tell them about your victimization, we don't care about your cognitive capacity. They have to report it. Again, some of you are calling Andy right now. He attacks self-care. Now he's attacking our mandatory reporting laws. No, I'm not. Because we can justify mandatory reporting. And some of you are thinking ahead already with beneficence, right? Our obligation to do good and remove harm. Again, this goes to my objective number one. I'm just trying to get us to all think about that 
everything we do has an ethical component. So our mandatory reporting laws aren't just our moral reaction. They just aren't our legal reaction or what our laws say. They're not just a political issue here in Pennsylvania. We have an issue right now of whether banks should report or not. Um, they are not currently considered a mandatory reporting. There's a move to add them as, as, and as well as in other states. But that has an ethical component. And we would be remiss if we don't take ethics along the journey of protective services. We run the risk of hurting the very people we are entrusted to serve. So practice, supervision, policy, everything we do has an ethical component. Justice A is our obligation to provide equal treatment for all individuals. Whenever I, because generally RPS folks and when there's group of allied disciplines, you are very smart folks, you're deeper level thinkers. And so I'll ask questions about what gets in the way of justice and you'll give some like really deep answers like implicit bias and all of these kinds of things that are, are just a hundred percent right. But I always laugh at myself because my number one threat to justice, my number one threat to provide equal treatment for all individuals is not that deep. It's that I like some clients more than others. Some clients drive me crazy. There are others I like. You made me cookies on the last investigation I was out there. I don't know if it was ethical that I ate the cookies, but those were really good cookies. So I'm hoping to spend some more time with you. I'm hoping to give you that extra 10 minutes to see if you'll offer me some milk with the cookies. You, on the other hand, for the last four times that I've been out there, have resisted everything, and you've told me where to stick my protective services, and it wasn't very nice. And so I'm not going to give you that 10 minutes. I'm going to give cookie person that 10 minutes. I'm not saying I consciously think about that, but it is a threat of justice. And all of us, when we are honest with ourselves, we connect better with some people professionally than others. Implicit bias, bias, all of those types of things affect our justice. Certain regulations and policies affect treating everybody equitable, but sometimes it comes down to the very practical of how we relate to people. Andy, I'm going to ask if you would put up uh, the poll. I'm going to continue to talk and go over fidelity, but this poll is very simple. I'm just asking if you are a truthful person. Are you a truthful person? So go ahead and answer. I'm going to talk about fidelity for a second so we don't have that awkward pause. But go ahead and answer, are you a truthful person? We'll come back to that in a second with veracity. Fidelity is our obligation to serve the well-being of the best interest of a person without divided loyalties. I've given you direct practice examples. I've given you policy examples. Now I'm going to target the supervisors in the room, and I'm going to give you some cover at work. Unnecessary meetings for our supervisors are unethical. Unnecessary meetings for supervisors are unethical because supervisors have, they're not clients, but supervisors need to have a loyalty to their staff. And I've been in too many human service agencies and even protective service agencies where we are running our supervisors thin and not giving them the adequate time. And I'd love to know, we should have probably had a poll on this, Andy, for just a yes, no, of have you ever been in an unnecessary meeting that could have been handled with a three bullet email? And I'm gonna guarantee 100% people raise their hand and say I think yes. you're right. Yeah. And so it's that obligation to serve well-being and best interest without divided loyalties. On the direct practice level, sometimes it's just documentation that divides our loyalty, right? Somebody, what I've heard PS investigators say this, and I understand where they're coming from. They, they'll say something like, I almost didn't want them to continue because I just kept thinking about all the documentation I was going to have to do. Thinking through which services that you give somebody based upon the level of requirements and documentation necessary to get those uh, services. Andy, can you share the, the results of our truthfulness poll? 
And Andy, could you read those to me? Because I'm not sure where to see Cer them. Certainly, yes. No. Okay. So it looks like, are you a truthful person? 62% said yes. Okay. 1% said no. Okay. 29% said sometimes. Okay. And 8% said hmm. Yeah, okay. Dot, dot, dot. Well, 62% of you then are liars. You're liars. <laughs> You're not lying. Asked you though a very specific question. I did not ask you if you were honest. I asked you if you were truthful. The reason for that is from an ethical principle standpoint. Veracity is our obligation to share everything we think, we feel, and we believe about a situation. So that person that drives me crazy that I don't like, I'm supposed to tell them that. And again, some of you are thinking ahead, you're going, well, we don't do that. Because the truth hurts. You are exactly right. Because telling the truth can violate non maleficence in certain situations. But it is that obligation to share. And what's also interesting is we as professionals tend to expect more truthfulness, veracity from other professionals and clients than we tend to give out ourselves. So veracity, and I didn't mean to offend all 61% of you, I know that you're all honest people, but are you truthful? And again, we're going to rank these principles based upon the circumstance of how truthful, how much do we share with a person? If we believe somebody needs to go to a nursing facility for the rest of their life, and that's what we think, do we tell them that, or do we tell them we're going to get them there for some short-term rehab and see what happens? Veracity says we paint the entire picture. Like I said, in ethical decision making, we rank principles based upon situations and based upon specific situations. This is just a sample. And I, my ethical consults are very, very scientific. I grab a scrap piece of paper and I say, here are the principles, let's rank them. And then let's talk about it. So I am not suggesting that these are the right principles. This is just an illustration of how I might initially rank a set of principles for somebody smoking with oxygen away from others versus somebody smoking with oxygen close to others. You'll see right away a big difference between where I rank autonomy. Autonomy, smoking with oxygen away from others, it's pretty high. And my obligation to do good and actually remove harm starts to shrink. Doesn't mean it's not important, but it means that I'm not going to violate or I'm going to try not to violate autonomy in the name of beneficence because I prioritize autonomy higher. You'll also see fidelity. Fidelity is very low for smoking with oxygen close to others because it is not just about my loyalty to that one individual. Justice creeps up because I'm looking at providing kind of equal treatment, equal concepts. So if they live in a duplex or a senior high rise, we've had one of those situations here in Pennsylvania, they live in a senior high rise. I'm not just thinking about the individual that I'm face to face with. I'm thinking about the broader scope. That's what we do. And again, we don't have a lot of time together today, so I'm going fairly quickly, but that's what we do in ethical situations. I once had somebody come up uh, when I'm doing this in the classroom, very angry with me at the break, and they said, you are a situational ethicist. And I said, first of all, I'm not an ethicist. I'm a social worker. And number two, yes, I am. Because we work with people and every circumstance is different. Some of you are already thinking ahead and going, but Chris, you didn't have enough information to rank those. And you would be 100% right. If you hear me speak about other things like interviewing and, and, and other areas of protective services, you know that I am all about making the work of protective services as efficient as possible. In documentation, I say every keystroke matters, every keystroke takes time. So making things as efficient as possible, except for when it comes to ethical situations. Then it is time to ask more questions. And in the interest of time, I, the, the PowerPoint is downloadable. You can email me. These are a model that I have adopted over to protective services of the types of questions that we need to add on 
when we're dealing with an ethics situation? What are the risk indications? I think we're generally good about doing a risk assessment. We're getting a lot better than when I started in 2002. We had more tools. But are we also asking the question of not only what's the risk if we don't act, but what's the risk if we do? So our typical hoarding situation, what's the risk if we don't act, if we don't do a cleanup here? But what's also the short-term and the long-term risk of if we do? And it may not mean that we may still do the cleanup, even knowing that there would, might be some psychological harm to these two, but we weigh that in as important. What The risk from intervening is as important as the risk from not intervening from an ethical standpoint. Next set of questions are the preferences of the individual. And if you ever ask me for input on an ethical situation, I will always ask you the same thing. How do we know the real-time preferences of the individual that we're talking about? This is a picture to make sure you haven't zoned out virtually, but this is also a picture of a young woman by the name of Bernice Youngblood. And to make a very long story short, the nursing home uh, was sued by Bernice's family saying Bernice would never do something like this with this male dancer. I don't know Bernice, I don't know the case, I just know it from the newspaper articles. But from the newspaper articles, I didn't like the family's answer from an ethics standpoint, and I didn't like the facility's answer from an ethics standpoint. The family said she would never do something like this. And I went, how do you know at this moment, at this time, that she wouldn't? Maybe this was on the bucket list. We all have kind of those secret bucket lists. This is not the time for confession in the chat, but we all have those secret bucket list items. Maybe she just didn't tell you that she always would have wanted this. How do you know? But I didn't like the facility's answer either. The facility reported because the, the women and the activities committee, uh, uh, the female activities committee on this from this facility voted to have these dancers come in because the men had gotten to go out to a certain restaurant. You can guess the name of the restaurant and the women weren't able to do it. They didn't go to McDonald's, the men, they went to Hooters. So the women said, we're gonna bring this activity to us. And the facility said, we vote, they voted on it, we brought them in. And I would ask the facility the same question. How do you know what their preferences were at the time, preferences change. And it's an important thing for protective services. Oftentimes we gather preferences at the very beginning, but preferences can change over weeks, months. Preferences can change over five minutes. They can change in two seconds about what we want or what we don't want. Quality of life, quality of life is a question that I would love to be have added to every assessment. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that because our assessments are off, our initial assessments are oftentimes long enough already. But how do you define your own quality of life? I love these two pictures. The first picture is, I'm, it's not pro-smoking, it's not anti-smoking, but if you live to 100 to be able to light your cigarette off your birthday candles, God bless you. Unless you want smoking cessation, I'm probably not even offering. But on the other one, and I, if you know me, I am a big supporter of everyday lives. I'm a big supporter of adults with disabilities and intellectual disabilities being able to experience love, romance, intimacy to their level of capacity. But this is a dating site that caters, and everybody on this call knows that this is also a blue light special for scams and romance scams. But many of you have interviewed an adult with a disability or an older adult who is being scammed and they will say this they will go yeah they asked me for a lot of money and i think it's a little shady but you know what they call every day they're my they're my friend quality of life i'm not saying we don't intervene i'm not saying we don't substantiate the case of financial exploitation but i am saying that at times people are willing to put up with a lot for their perceived quality of life Contextual factors, and I will go no further, we'll wrap up here in a couple minutes. I will go no further than this damn pandemic. Hopefully by 
350, I'm able, and I know you well enough to say this damn pandemic, because it is. And it ain't over. And there have been lots of ethical decisions. Some of you in your states have said, we are ethically going to put the lives of older adults over the safety of our workers by sending people still out into the field. Other states have said exactly the opposite. They said, we are gonna value the, the safety and the welfare of our staff over being able to do thorough investigations for older adults. And I know some of you are about ready to call Andy again and say he's attacking our COVID precaution. If Andy hasn't aborted this uh, presentation yet, if he hasn't put the off button on the webinar, he's not going to. What I'm suggesting again, for probably the 20th time, is that these decisions are not just policy, they're not just safety, they're not just regulatory, they are ethical decisions. And we need to think through the ethical components. And we're not done yet. And some of you have already been doing this and I'm, I'm gonna drop one and then move on. But are we gonna require our PS investigators to get a vaccine? Is that gonna be a requirement of doing the job? Not only is the pandemic not over yet, and we have decisions about what to do, we are also gonna have long-term decisions about health and welfare of both older adults and our staff, and they need to be thought of as ethical things. All that to say, and then I'll open it up here in the last few minutes for questions. Ethical decisions are not easy. We took a journey. We started with talking about the uniqueness of protective services and allied disciplines. We then went and talked about some of the basic definitions and the importance of principles and how we would begin applying them to certain situations and prioritizing some over others, whether it be in practice, policy, or supervision. And finally, we talked about questions that you need to ask whether it be an ethical dilemma with a client or even just an issue with, do I accept the gift or not? And I know some of you are like, it's not it, we can't accept gifts. That's your policy, that's your immediate reaction. But sometimes not accepting a gift violates the principle of non-maleficence and doing, because we insult people, we offend people by not accepting that. So these types of ideas, these questions, and this ranking of principles can fall into every level of decision that we make. But the last thing I wanna leave you with, and I could have started here and let you all go, because if you remember nothing else of what I say, I want you to remember this, that the most dangerous and deadly ethical decisions are made alone. Ethics by its very nature takes conversation, it takes dialogue, it takes supervision, it takes two or more people thinking through from an ethical framework. And history, even in protective services, is filled with deadly and dangerous decisions that were made because people felt they needed to make the ethical decision alone. It's a group process. Last slide, and then Andy, any questions? Administration for Community Living must have been reading my mind when they put out these recommendations on ethics. I will leave these here for you, um, basically saying what I said to you. If we don't take ethics along for the protective services journey, we run the risk of hurting the very people that are, we are entrusted to serve. I will, uh, Andy, if there are questions, I will put my email up here. I am totally open to, to consultation questions uh, that you might have. Andy, were there any questions? There are a few questions. Thank you for this, Chris. I know these are complicated yeah. questions. Ethics is not always a simple thing. If no. Ever. For sure. Um, and if anybody's interested in those guidelines that Chris had up on the slide before, those are the uh, ACL voluntary consensus guidelines. You can contact the APS TARC. We'll point you to where they are if you're not familiar with them. They're very, very helpful. So um, I, I will just start with one question, and this is a, a tricky one. So I'm going to throw a, right. a curveball at you. Um, okay. This was a rather long question, so I'm going to shorten it a bit. How do you balance undue influence? and self-interest by other parties. Um, okay. The elder can lose their home, be displaced to facilities. Um, you know, the majority of elders want to stay in their home. And if you're yeah. familiar with undue influence, it's a tricky situation. Ah, uh, yeah. And, and, and probably the trickiest part about undue influence is when somebody has been effective at undue influence, it's really hard to diagnose because they've been so effective at it. So that person's decision almost becomes the other person's decision. It's, it's tough to, to kind of parse that out. 
I think it's, and I don't know if this is the exact answer to your question uh, or to the question, but, and if we had more time, it is an area that we dive into a lot with ethics. So you cannot have autonomy without informed consent. You cannot have informed consent when there is undue influence. And that undue influence can come from a variety of sources. That undue influence can obviously come from family, it can come from perpetrators, that's kind of where we all, but it can also come for, from doctors, physicians, and there are physicians on the call. I'm not blasting you, but in my days of hospital social work, I could spend hours trying to talk somebody into going to a nursing home and get nowhere. You'd walk in and you'd say, hey, you need to go to a nursing home for some uh, 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 rehab. I'm ready to go instantly. And I'd always be like, you have that conversation first now. I'm not sure that that's pure and bad undue influence, but there's undue influence in the fact that you're a physician. Uh, protective services, we can unduly, that right word, influence people as well. Anytime that there is a power differential in the sources that are coming into a person's life, we have to address the undue influence. It's a very short answer. Other than to say, it is a critically important, it is something that we tease out because again, you can't have autonomy without informed consent and you can't have informed, con and don't think of just a piece of paper. Think of informed consent as the ability to make decisions based upon information. So you can't have autonomy without informed consent. You can't have an informed consent when there's undue influence. Um, another good question and another tricky one. What role uh -huh. does, <laughs> what, what role it's does- six, six o'clock, right? <laughs> what role does cognitive capacity and right to self-determination play yeah. in the involuntary services scenario? Yeah, yeah. So, again, I, so, oh, man, you're right. Uh, that is a, a tricky question. So, just trying to think of the, the best way to try to get at where I think you're going. So, cognitive capacity is always critical. And, and everything we do in protective services is also critical in ethics. We need to know that that, again, to have autonomy, you need to have informed consent. To have having an informed consent, you need capacity. But as I suggested, we also know in this group that capacity is not on a dichotomy. Capacity is on a continuum. So I can speak to somebody at 10 a.m. and they're gonna have a certain level of ethical rights from their capacity at 10 a.m. that they're no longer gonna have at three o'clock in the afternoon. And from an ethics standpoint, not necessarily from a legal standpoint, so I don't want to get anybody in trouble with the law, but just because somebody is appointed a guardian or legal decision maker doesn't take away their right to make the decisions that they're capacitated to make. I fought with a nursing home once that refused to give the older adult uh, vanilla ice cream and would only serve them chocolate because the guardian said they liked chocolate despite tons of evidence that the older adult wanted built the older, there were no allergies or anything like that. I said, you gotta give them, they're like, but they have a guardian. We have, I'm like, I don't think that the guardian's rights determine or over um, the capacity of that person to choose ice cream. Could have they done their own financial matters? No, no, we're not gonna do it. So capacity is a very fluid concept, both legally, obviously, both medically, but also ethically. Ethics do revolve on involuntary interventions, especially if somebody is not capacitated. But we don't, from an ethics standpoint, look at, at an either or scenario. We look at a level of capacity, a level of capacity to make certain determinations and assessments. And if your state is anywhere like Pennsylvania, so much of our involuntary interventions are judge dependent here in Pennsylvania, local judge dependent. So from a legal standpoint, there are certain areas of Pennsylvania where I can get anybody an involuntary intervention. There are others where you can be running naked through town and you're not getting an involuntary intervention. From an ethics standpoint, we discuss that capacity and the fluidity of the capacity. Hopefully that gets at your question a bit. Andy, is there time for one more? I think let's let's do one more. And this is a tricky one too. This person um, mentioned your story earlier about the son who said he killed the person yeah. who was threatening them and and you know, did you report this to the police? And this gets to the question of what do you do when you have to make a report to the police and the client yeah. doesn't want you to? 
Yeah, so again, I, I, I refer you back to your regulations and laws. In, 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 in my, my story, my initial introduction to protective services, the police were already involved. We found that out pretty early. Son said they had already um, and did not press charges to my knowledge, or at least at the time that I stopped uh, having knowledge of the case. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we struggle with that a lot because we are in our Institute on Protective Services through our Department of Aging is very much about prosecution and getting cases prosecuted. In our law and in our statute, it requires voluntary consent of the older adult to make that referral. Again, it's from an ethics standpoint, and I'm not going to weigh in specifically on whether we should or not. My dog's barking, which you probably can hear, it means it's, they know it's four o'clock, is that it's going to be an autonomy question versus a beneficence question. And it gets even more complicated in protective services, especially when it comes to financial exploitation, because do we view it as a crime against the individual or do we view it as a crime against the community? If somebody is being exploited and taking away their assets to afford care. So there's a lot of moving parts in there, but the bottom line to make that determination is where are we going to put in a particular circumstance someone's our need to do good and remove harm versus their autonomy, not just to make their own decisions, but to experience the consequences of their own actions. What else? Or I guess we're up on time, right? Yeah, I think I think we'll probably have to wrap it up there. Um, Chris, if you don't mind to go to the very last slide real quick. Um, and there was quite a few comments. Chris, this was a very helpful webinar. People really enjoyed it. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that. Um, the right one? Yep, that's the right one. So if anybody wants to reach out to us, here is how you do that. You have an email address and the web address. You can download the slides as a handout right now and these uh, this information is on there. I just wanted to thank Chris for this very thought provoking, very interesting webinar. It's tricky. Ethics is tricky in all fields, but in protective services, there's a whole load of issues that we don't always think about that we come into play with it. So. Thank you so much for this, Chris. Yeah, and I just want to thank you. If you haven't picked up on it, I have a passion for protective services. So you thank do. you for joining. Thank you for having this conversation with me. And I would love to continue this dialogue at any time with any of you. So thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for attending today. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you fill out your evaluation. Uh, it'll come in an email tomorrow, but it should also pop up on your screen as soon as we hit end. So um, have a great afternoon, everyone. Take care.